Are you a sad individual living under a prison opera house and dropping chandeliers on people's heads for fun? Well, you may want to stop because that's a crime and get yourself a podcast. How do you do that? Easy. It's with Anchor. Anchor is a totally free app and website, and you can record from your phone or your computer. You don't need fancy smancy equipment. Seriously, I have recorded podcasts from my bathtub while I was bathing. Anchor is free and super easy to use. Anchor has really simple podcasting tools. You sign up and then you start podcasting. It really is that simple. Within an hour of starting my podcast, I was already distributed on Spotify. Now I'm on Spotify, Google Podcasts, Breaker, and Radio Public. So go look for the app or the website. The website is anchor.fm. And the app, just go to your friendly local app store and look up Anchor. That's A-N-C-H-O-R. Happy podcasting! Hello, hello, my hoopy fruits. It's Sarah from the Kauai Study Breakfast. And uh, for this section of episodes, we will be discussing The Secret of Tarot Castle by Robert Arthur. It is the first book in the Three Investigator series. And uh, I actually wrote a bit about it on my blog, and then due to chronic illness, my hands got tired, so I decided why not talk about it. Um, The posts are still up on my blog, I'm not going to delete them for the podcast, that's kind of silly, but I will kind of go over some of the same material. There were some um, parts of it that were scheduled to be posted But uh, I think that I'm just going to delete those and not going to bother. So anyway, my history with the three investigators. Well, first of all, the series was published in 1964. Um, I actually discovered the books by accident. Um, I was at a library sale where you could get books for like super cheap, like a quarter a book. And it was like a dollar for hardback. So it's like a ridiculous ridiculously good deal like even for the 80s this was back in California when I lived in Southern California so I grabbed the book and I can't remember for life of me which one I wanted but I knew that it was not one called The Mystery of the Sunny Parrot which is the second book in the series so I got home and I was like oh man I don't want this book but whatever, it's here. I'll read it anyway. So I fell in love with the series. Um, unfortunately, um, the books were like 20 years old and they weren't like up in like Crown and Walden books and stuff like that. So I had to do a little hunting. And this was like before eBay and things like paperbackswap.com where you could easily, you know, just type it in and find it so it it took me a while but uh I I actually got hold of most of them I was pretty proud of myself and then they all disappeared so now I have an electronic copy of it so that's what I'm going to be reading from and I will be reading some section of books because some of them um especially the intro by Alfred Hitchcock are just they have to be read to be understood their glory. And by the way, in case you're wondering, no, it's not actually Alfred Hitchcock. I'm not even sure how that works. Um, I guess they say this actually has no resemblance to any person living or dead. I think that that may be why they do that. But uh, anyway, I've been babbling enough. I, I really like this series and I'd like to talk about it with people, but nobody else has read it. So figure, hey, talk about it on the podcast. Anyway, hope you enjoy it as much as I do. Bye. Just a little warning before you get started if you hear any strange noises. It is because my feral goblin child, who I love dearly, is playing Minecraft. Thanks. And here we go. Secret of Terror Castle by Robert Arthur. Notice to the reader, you are under no obligation whatever to read a single word of this introduction, Alfred Hitchcock. Now, I have to disagree. I think you have got to listen to this introduction because it it contains some really fun stuff. 
And no, I'm not going to try and imitate its hoss voice. There is no way I will be able to do that. So, Alfred Hitchcock, introduction. I seem to be constantly introducing something. For years, I've been introducing my television programs. I've introduced motion pictures. And I've introduced books of mystery, ghosts, and suspense stories for my fans to shiver with. Now, I find myself introducing a trio of lads who call themselves the three investigators and ride around in a gold-plated Rolls Royce, solving mysteries, riddles, enigmas, and conundrums of all kinds. Preposterous, isn't it? Frankly, I would prefer to have nothing to do with these three youths, but I rashly promised to introduce them, and I am a man of my word, even though the wor- even though the promise was extorted from me by nothing less than sheer skullduggery, as you will see. To the business at hand, then. The three boys who call themselves the three investigators are Bob Andrews, Pete Crenshaw, and Jupiter Jones, all who live in Rocky Beach, a small city on the shore of the Pacific Ocean, some miles from Hollywood. Bob Andrews, who is small but wiry, is something of a scholarly type, although with an adventurous spirit. Pete Crenshaw is quite tall and muscular. Jupiter Jones is... Well, I shall refrain from giving you my own personal opinion of Jupiter Jones. You will have to decide about him for yourself after reading the pages that follow. I shall simply stick to the facts. Therefore, though I would be sorely tempted to call Jupiter Jones fat, I will simply say, as his friends do, that he is stocky. As a very small child, Jupiter Jones appeared in a television series about a group of comical children, a series I am happy to say I never encountered. However, it appears that as an infant, he was so fat and comical in appearance, he was known as Baby Fatso and made millions laugh as the way he kept falling over things. This gave him a deep aversion to being laughed at. In order to get him taken seriously, he studied furiously. From the time he could read, he read everything he could get his hands on, science, psychology, criminology, and many other subjects. Having a good memory, he retained much of what he read, so that in school, his teachers found it best to avoid getting into arguments with him about questions of fact. They, find they found themselves proved wrong too often. If at this point Jupiter Jones sounds rather insufferable, I can only agree with you heartily. However, I am told he has many loyal friends. But then, there is no accounting for the taste of the young. Now, I could tell you a great deal more about him and the other boys. I could tell you how Jupiter won the use of the gold-plated car in a contest. I could tell you how he established a local reputation for finding lost articles, including runaway pets. I could... But I feel I have done my duty. I have more than lived up to my promise. If you haven't skipped all this long ago, you are probably even gladder than I am that this introduction has ended. Alfred Hitchcock Chapter 1 Alfred Hitchcock and the Three Investigators We open up with Bob Andrews coming home from his job at the library. His mother informs him that he has a phone message from Jupiter Jones and then starts talking about all the amazing things Jupiter has done, like finding a ring and like all the pets he's found. And poor Bob is like, Mom, can I just please have the message? And she goes on and on. Bob's like, Mom, really, can I please have the message? And then she starts talking about the the Rolls Royce that Jupiter won in a contest, and Bob explains that basically he sat, Jupiter sat and looked at the jar, and he basically counted, and it really wasn't like psychic powers. It just took deduction and patience, and his mom's like, oh, but he's so great, and poor Bob's like, mom, can I just please have my freaking message. Finally, Mrs. Andrews gives poor Bob the message, and the message is Green Gate 1. The presses are ruling. And Bob's like, yay, thanks! And he skittles out the door, and his mom's like, but, but Bobbert! She doesn't actually call him Bobbert, but she should have. She's like, is this like some magical code? And he's like, no, it's just English. And then he leaves. And he's riding his bike, and his brace is hurting him. He has the brace because he's broke his leg because he was climbing a mountain. Why was he climbing a mountain? I don't know. He's not Captain Kirk. So Bob gets to the Jones salvage yard, which the books make sure to point out that Jupiter got his uncle to change it from the Jones junkyard because it sounded better, which 
really Jupiter, you gotta be that extra, but of course Jupiter Jones would do that. But um so the boys hangout is at a junkyard, which I always thought was super cool because there is so much stuff there and like so many ways to play around with it. So I thought that the the idea of hanging out at a junkyard was, was pretty nifty, but maybe I'm just weird. So anyway, Bob found finds the Green Gate one and he enters the Jupiter's workshop and hey, guess what? <laughs> there is a printing press there and it's actually rolling. So Jupiter was telling him to go to Green Gate one and the presses were rolling meant that he actually got the printing press operational which is pretty funny when you think about it because it wasn't so much as a code as like Mrs. Andrews just had no context for what he was saying but whatever <clears throat> so Jupiter has been printing out business cards and they are the three investigators we investigate anything and then there's three question marks and there's the first investigator, second investigator, and third. It's like, so what's the deal with the question mark? And Jupiter is basically, it's to make people ask questions. And then he goes on this long thing about enigmas and conundrums. And I swear he has got to be like one of the most pretentious people ever. So pretentious. I love him as a character, but oh, he is just beyond pretentious. And not in a really good way either. So anyway, Jupiter is like, yay, we have our first case, but there's a problem, which is that Alfred Hitchcock is looking for a haunted house for a movie in, and they've tried, <coughs> excuse me, they've, and Jupiter's tried to provide his services, but he was blocked by his secretary, who is named Henrietta Larson, she was a couple grades above them, but they know her, and they call her Bossy Henrietta and talk about a bunch of snack for her doing her job properly, which really, seriously, Team Henrietta, hello, but uh, <laughs> it turns out that Jupiter gets the use of the Rolls Royce tomorrow, so he's going to go to the film studio and get Alfred Hitchcock to give them the job, and he hands Bob, like, one of the business cards with the word Terror Castle on the back. And Bob's like, um, sure, whatever. <laughs> and then Jupiter says to him, and I quote, Carry a supply of our cards with you at all time. They will be your credentials. And tomorrow, every man will do his duty, come what may. Do, do you see what I mean? That's just weird. He's, Jupiter is such a weird kid, but I love him and I love these books and this is going to be really fun. But uh, yeah, so that's the end of chapter one. Have a happy day and keep it fruity.